Okay. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Tired? No? I'm surprised, all right. Well, that's good because my slides are pretty heavy. So I'm Greg. These are some of the things that I've done. At OK Turtles, it's a nonprofit. We support beneficial decentralization technologies. I'm going to be blowing through these slides really quick. I have a whole bunch of them and not enough time. Today, I'm going to be focusing on that thing right there called DPKI, which is Decentralized Public Key Infrastructure. There's three main things I'd like to get across today, which is what is DPKI, what is the problem that it's solving, and what is the DCS triangle? The DCS triangle is something that was recently discovered in a sense, and it's something that everybody in this room should know about. So first, let's begin with a problem. Everybody has entered a URL into their web browser. Now, what happens when you hit enter? Well, DNS returns an IP address. This isn't a secure lookup. That IP address returns a certificate. And that certificate is validated using SSL and TLS, secure socket layer, transport layer security. That's what makes the little lock icon appear. And specifically, it's these entities, every computer and every web browser ships with at least on the order of 200 what are called root certificate authorities. These are usually companies, sometimes governments, and always people you've never heard of and probably haven't met in your life. And every one of those entities has the ability to make the lock icon appear. So what's the problem with this? Well, this is how the internet is secured today. The entire security of the entire internet depends on this system called X509. And today there are over 1,000 entities because every one of those root certificate authorities has the ability to give their own power to make the lock icon appear to anybody else. These are called intermediary certificate authorities. So that can be used to conduct a man-in-the-middle attack. If you compromise any one of those entities, you can make that lock icon appear for any website on the internet. And in effect, when your browser connects to a website, it checks the certificate, asks, is this legit? And it's as though somebody in a massive crowd like this shouts, yeah, sure. And then your browser tells the user that the connection is secure, even though that's not true. So let's clearly define the problem. I don't know why the slides are like that. This is the problem. Who can define your identity to complete strangers online when you aren't there in person to identify yourself? You know, if you're an engineer and you're trying to solve this problem, think about how you would do it. Well, the way they did it before is they came up with this list of certificate authorities that everybody trusts. Now, you have to ask yourself, is there a good reason to trust all of these entities that you've picked? And then you have to ask yourself, well, is this the mechanism, the system that I've come up as an engineer trying to solve this problem? Is it usable? Is it easy to use for regular users? Can I access all my favorite games and visit all my favorite websites and be secure? So I'm going to blow past this part. These are previous attempts at solving this problem. We've got X509 just covered it. DNS sec is complicated, over 10 RFCs. It's unnecessary because it doesn't really do anything on top of TLS. In fact, it makes the problem much worse. DNS sec is broken. There's this wonderful website that keeps track of just how broken it is. These are all the various different outages that have happened. Actually, that's not the complete list. That's not the complete list either. <laughs> Various bugs. It's a very complicated, broken protocol. It's less secure than X509. And that's because it asks you to trust even more entities simultaneously. Entities you have absolutely no reason to trust. Another solution that was proposed was convergence by Moxie Marilyn Spike, the guy behind Signal. Uh, it was kind of abandoned, and there are some problems with it. 
Google pointed out that it doesn't protect, for example, from a man-in-the-middle attack on the server side. And even though there were claims along these lines saying that you know, it gave users choice, it really didn't because users don't know which notaries to pick, what trusted authorities to pick. And so in practice, browsers would ship with the same list of notar notaries. But it did offer a real improvement on today's system. And that improvement came through this concept. If there's, I'm going to be talking about various different concepts today, maybe like you know, three concepts. This is one of those three concepts that everyone in this room should understand. The word consensus and what that word specifically means. Consensus is any time a group of independent entities, and that's key, they have to be independent, agree on a decision, on some kind of a decision using some voting threshold. We're going to return to this concept because it's going to be one of the corners of that DCS triangle that I mentioned that I hope everyone after today is super familiar with. So pinning is simple but difficult to use. It's ineffective for various reasons. Of the various mechanisms, HPKP, which I don't have time to talk about, is the most secure, but it's not easy to use. So real quick, what are namespaces? Well, there are a space with names in them. And if you have a duplicate name in it, well, that's not allowed. So it's effectively a key value mapping. In order to fix the internet security, you have to have a namespace. It's just required. Now, the problem with today's system is that we've got two separate namespaces that aren't really linked very well together, and there's no consensus about what they are. Who should decide what that mapping should be? Whenever you register a domain, should it be some random third party? No, it should be you. The person who registered the domain should be the one deciding what the value for that mapping is. If they're not, the man in the middle attack is a threat. Centralized versus decentralized namespaces, global namespaces. So with centralized namespaces, those that are controlled by a single authority, you do not control the mappings in that. You cannot, because they do. They're incapable of providing ownership for that reason, and they're incapable of censorship resistance. On the other hand, decentralized namespaces do, for the very reason that they're decentralized, provide real ownership. Just like Bitcoin, which is a decentralized consensus system, provides real ownership of digital tokens. Who controls the mappings? You do, because there's real ownership, as long as it remains decentralized. And this is key. Decentralized namespaces are not optional. They are a fundamental requirement for accessing things online. You can have a centralized namespace within some kind of a company that operates on top of the internet, like Twitter. But the internet as a whole is a decentralized system. And unless you want the entire internet to be controlled by a single company, you need a decentralized namespace. Decentralized namespaces are what make you possible. They are what give the space for companies to exist within them. Unfortunately, there's this thing called Zuko's Triangle, which says that you can't really have a decentralized, secure, human-readable namespace. Now, this is debatable. And I believe it actually is possible to do this. So we'll talk about new attempts. We'll go through these real quickly. I'm not going to go into detail on some of these, because on any of them, really, except for DPKI and maybe a little bit on STP, uh, because I don't have time. So if you go into the OK Turtles blog, you can read in much more detail about the properties of these systems, whether or not they provide man-in-the-middle detection, man-in-the-middle prevention, whether they're scalable, whether they're censorship resistant, DOS resistant. DPKI is the one that I'm most excited about. So a quick note on the Stellar Consensus Protocol, because it's something that you need to be aware of when somebody is marketing one of these consensus systems to you. In Stellar's marketing, they have this nice cartoon that's not so nice in its explanation because it's a little bit misleading. It says that anyone has permission, and you don't, uh, you don't need to ask for permission to participate in the consensus. Now, that's highly misleading because what they're really saying is anybody has permission to listen and validate the outcome of the consensus. But that is completely different 
from actually participating and having a voice in consensus. Completely different. And not everybody can actually participate in the selection of what goes into the consensus and stellar consensus protocol. And as we'll see, this applies to all consensus protocols. So there's a, I'm specifically singling out stellar consensus protocol because one of the ITF working groups is considering using it for the entire internet. That's a horrible idea. Because what you'll eventually have is an internet cartel that controls by itself who can register what website, who owns what website. And we, want, we, we don't want that. We want to continue having the lovely decentralized internet. So this is why DPKI explicitly allows for arbitrary consensus protocols, as long as they fit the mathematical notion of decentralization. Many people talk about how their project is decentralized, but most of those people are using it as a marketing buzzword, and they don't really know what that term actually means. It has a concrete mathematical definition, and we'll get into that. So DPKI is different. It has to be different because it recognizes consensus capture. What is that? Consensus capture is when you have a group of people who are trying to agree on something, or a group of computers that are coming to some decision. Now, let's say that our system suddenly gets users. And these users, for example, they could be Bitcoin users relying on the consensus of miners, decide to use the system. Well, initially, we start out with everybody being a consensus participant, and we gain some users who are not part of the consensus. Our system is successful. People really like it because it's initially decentralized, and so it gains more users and more users and more users until you have what is effectively the 1% controlling the consensus, and this is called consensus capture. So for this reason, DPKI does not specify a single consensus protocol. It is a protocol for consensus protocols. DPKI in two parts. There is the notion of TLDs in DPKI. So .eth will take you to Ethereum and get you the Ethereum namespace. .bit will take you to Namecoin. And each of these will have different trust assumptions and different security properties. But they're both decentralized in their own way. And the second part of DPKI concerns itself with the actual identifiers and the values for, of those identifiers, identifiers that are stored in the consensus system. So what, by identifier, I just mean a name. So twitter.com could be a, an identifier, or twitter.bit, or twitter.ens, um, or whatever. And the question is, well, if I have a profile, and it's one of these decentralized identifiers, we call them DIDs, and I use my phone, which has a private key on it, and I suddenly lose that phone, which I use to sign messages that people use to, to verify my identity. What happens? Well, DPKI has solutions for that. I'm not going to get into them today. So these are the various answers to that original problem that I talked about that these systems give. And you'll notice that in DPKI, who can define your identity is your chosen delegates and it also depends on the consensus system that you chose. So this brings us to the DCS triangle. The, D the DCS triangle was independently discovered by myself and Trent McConaughey. He found out about it first and wrote a really excellent blog post on the Big Chain DB blog about this triangle. And recently, last week, I published something called the DCS theorem, which tries in a mathematical way to prove that systems are likely to centralize, that decentralized consensus systems are likely. It's a probability proof. It doesn't say they're guaranteed to centralize, but that they're likely to centralize as a decentralized consensus system gains users, and scale, in other words. This is the triangle. So on the left, we have systems like Facebook, Twitter, iCloud, systems we're all familiar with today, systems that we all use today. These fit on the left side of the triangle. They are scalable, and they employ consensus. So Google servers, for example, use distributed consensus systems to manage all of their data, and so does iCloud, and so do all of these systems. But you'll notice they're all centralized. At the bottom, we have decentralized consensus systems, which are rather new in technology. And examples include Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
But we notice that they don't scale. So people talk about second layer solutions, like the Lightning Network. Why is it that the Lightning Network can scale, but Bitcoin can't? Well, that's because it doesn't use consensus. It only touches consensus briefly for certain fractions of a time that users are using the system. Anytime there's a dispute, in other words. Another example is BitTorrent. BitTorrent scales very well, as you know. And of course, there's TCP IP, the fundamental protocol of the internet. Scales very well. So in the DCS theorem paper, you can read the mathematical definitions of these systems. And so when, we, when I say consensus, I mean that the system's state is a shared state, shared among a bunch of computers. And these computers use a consensus algorithm to come to agreement about that shared state. Scale, I defined as the system being able to compete with any centralized system that's out there that does the same thing. And decentralized means that the system has no single point of failure or control. How do you know whether it does? Well, it depends on what you define as your system, and that's called the system scope. So the broader you define your scope, the more likely it is to have a single point of failure. The narrower you define your scope of what your system is, the less likely it is to have a single point of failure. I'm not going to get into details on that, but let's, let's talk about the mechanics of this triangle. So here's a system, S1. The red circle represents all of the users of the system and the consensus participants who are highlighted in green. Here is the intuition behind the proof. We note that most users do not have access to a data center at their house or a supercomputer. Super computer. They don't have access to large amounts of resources in terms of computation and networking. But a small number of users at the end there do. Most are up here, and a small number are there. So the proof goes essentially along these lines. The system gains users. So the red bubble expands. And what does that mean? Well, well, that means that the consensus participants have to handle more traffic. More users equals more traffic, more messages being sent through the network. More traffic means that some of the people who were previously part of the consensus group, who were running the consensus on their MacBook or whatever, are no longer able to keep up with all of that traffic. They just don't have enough hard drive space. They don't have enough bandwidth. So some of them drop out. And so the consensus group shrinks. And that's the intuition behind the DCS triangle. So how do you get around this? Well, getting around the DCS triangle involves you deciding to give up control and deciding to not be a megalomaniac and deciding that you are not going to try to conquer the world. You are going to voluntarily give some of your power to other people. And this way, you can design a nice system like the internet, which has benefited mankind as we know. So instead of doing the traditional approach, where you just do, like cancer, unrestricted growth, which undoubtedly leads to centralization and all the problems that come with it, you do this. You say, I'm going to release some code, and I'm going to let anyone who wants to run it run their own consensus system. And maybe some of these consensus systems can talk to each other, but they do so in a completely decentralized way. And this is how you get around the DCS triangle. 100% independent consensus systems. That scales, and that's the centralized. So last week, I was at Rebooting the Web of Trust. This is an organization, a group of people, a collective of entrepreneurs, of internet luminaries, and it's organized by Christopher Allen, the co-author of SSL TLS. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, well, it's called rebooting the web of trust, but effectively, we're trying to fix that problem that I described at the beginning with the certificate authority system and with the fact that you do not own your online identity today. Here's some photos. That's a photo of me and Vitalik at the first rebooting of web of trust working on the DPKI paper. 
This, is, uh, this was the Bitcoin table. You can see Joseph Poon, uh, Gregory Maxwell, uh, I think uh, Josh or Joe Banu. That's Peter Todd, Peter Weil. That's Christopher Allen there in the back. Uh, Juan Benet from IPFS. Kiara Robles, um, Kalia, Identity Woman. Manu Sporny. Sorry for, for uh, not remembering some of these names right now. Uh, Paul Stork, Truthcoin. Uh, Daniel Buckner from Microsoft. Um, Ryan Shea from Blockstack. Tony Lane. That there in the corner is uh, Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web. So what is rebooting all about? Well, it's an open effort to create open standards about some of the problems that other speakers have talked about here today. And some of uh, the speakers are actually working on implementations on these things. And this is about standardizing those implementations so that they can all cross collaborate and work together with different pieces of software and remain decentralized. That's the key point. And we've produced various different works already. A lot of people who attend Rebooting Web of Trust say that it's one of the few workshops that they come to where actual real work gets done. It's an intensive experience. We published the DPKI paper. We published a specification on decentralized identifiers. There's the verifiable, uh, verifiable claims specification, which we're working together with the W3C uh, credentials working group. Those are the kinds of things that say, you know, that can be used by governments or companies or anybody to make statements about other people. And you can, you know, add those to your decentralized identifier to identify yourself as a graduate of such and such a school or being over the age of 21 or, you know, whatever you would like. Actual implementations of software of some of these specifications and more. So attendees are expected to stay for all three days, working with their group and having a real deliverable by the end of the event. We have a great time while getting stuff done. So at the last rebooting, six companies demonstrated DIDs and verifiable claims on over two public blockchains, two private blockchains and IPFS. We're very aware, self-conscious, um, that the first rebooting web of trust was just a group of you know, a bunch of uh, white males. And since then, we've you know, gone out of our way to be more inclusive to invite more people, to offer scholarships, to move the event from the West Coast in San Francisco to the East Coast in places like Boston and New York. We even had one in Europe and Paris. And we invite all of you who are interested in this problem to please attend the next one, which is coming up. Um, I don't remember when, but follow Christopher Allen on Twitter. Go to uh, weboftrust.info, subscribe for the newsletter if you're interested. So in conclusion, Decentralized public key infrastructure is a protocol, will be a protocol that gives you actual reason to have faith in that lock icon. It gives you reason to trust it. Only decentralized namespaces are allowed. Identity that is controlled by you because of that. The spec requires decentralization at every point to minimize trust, including lookup. It requires that private keys never be generated or stored on the server, always client-side. Your choice of consensus system. So if you have a blockchain that you would like to be part of DPKI, you can do that. Some existing potential DPKI-friendly protocols and implementations include the already mentioned uh, DID, decentralized identifiers, the Ethereum Improvement Protocol 137, the Ethereum Domain um, Name Service, which is already up and running. You can register domain names on Ethereum today. Blockstack, which is doing the same thing, but on Bitcoin. Uportme, which is a personal identity system um, for identifying you know, profiles, individuals built on top of Ethereum. And if you're aware of any others that you would like mentioned, please come find me and let me know. Contributing, if you'd like to contribute, read the DPKI paper, go to the uh, weboftrust.info website, attend. No need to ask for permission to contribute. Feel free to pick up where other people have left off, get in touch, collaborate, ask questions. I believe that's all I have for today. Thank you.